Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Steve Staples. I'm the chairperson of PeaceQuest. And I'm really excited today because we're featuring a brand new book that is dealing with real politics, but is optimistic. And it's done by my good friend, Douglas Roach, who is joining me from Edmonton. Hi, Doug. Hi, Steve. Look, you, lots of people know you, but let me just do the introduction anyway, Doug. Douglas Roach was a progressive conservative member of parliament from Edmonton for over a decade during the 1970s and 80s. And he was Canada's ambassador for disarmament at the United Nations during the Cold War. And later he became a member of the Senate uh, until he reached the age of 75 when he couldn't be a senator anymore. Uh, but that didn't slow him down. He's continued to do work in the peace and disarmament field. He's written 22 books on peace, disarmament, and global co cooperation. His latest book, his 23rd book, is called Recovery, Peace Prospects in the Biden Era. Perfect timing with the election of Joe Biden in the United States. Now, Doug, you've met Joe Biden. What were your impressions of him and have they changed as you watched him campaign and win the presidency? Well, Steve, thanks. Uh, I met him in uh, 2001 and when we were both speakers at a conference in Philadelphia, he was a senator in the United States, I was a senator in Canada. And um, I thought that he was a very uh, strong minded and a very outgoing uh, politician. And I didn't think he was particularly progressive, uh, but he was um, progressive enough to appear at a meeting uh, designed to strengthen nuclear disarmament. So uh, that was a good start for our, for, our, for our encounter. You can imagine that time, because that was right after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 on New York City. And nobody yeah. wanted to talk about peace at that point. So to have everybody, him there, it's a good signal. Everybody was very distraught um, at the effect of the terrorist attacks. But he, he took that as an opportunity to say, well, this is a time when we can strengthen our relationships with Russia uh, to uh, sort of calm down uh, the world and uh, have the world recognize that the two great powers of the day would work together in fighting terrorism. And of course, that was a long time ago. We have the whole, his whole period as vice president with, with uh, Barack Obama and, and now the, uh, the uh, candidacy and finally his election win. You've used, you've put two words together, which I think you're describing Biden as pragmatic idealism. What, what does that mean and how does that capture Biden? Yes, well, he is, first of all, a very pragmatic man. He wants to be able to get things done. But I also call him, uh, Steve, I call him an ameliorator. An ameliorator is one who reaches out and uh, tries to connect with both sides of a controversy and um, does not impose his will, uh, but rather seeks some common ground. And I noticed as the years went by that Biden was doing that when he was in the Senate and of course, when he was vice president. And so when uh, 2020 arrived and the presidential campaign began with the Democrat primaries, I began to watch Joe Biden carefully and research his positions. And I said, well, I wonder what he would do on the peace agenda. And so uh, the peace agenda, which I've defined in previous books, is four pillars uh, for peace and security in the world. The first is economic and social development. The second is uh, the climate crisis, the environmental protection. The third is uh, arms control and disarmament. And the fourth is the advancement of human rights, particularly gender and uh, all those aspects of human rights that make up, make up, uh, that make up a, a, a safety for a person. And so when I, be, when I went into um, each of these four areas, uh, what Biden had said and what he had done, I became increasingly impressed. And I started to write and in the summer. And uh, as I was writing, 
uh, my, I felt my own spirits rising when I realized that this is a man who is not necessarily going to be a savior. He's not coming in on a white horse and going to save, save humanity. That's not the idea. What he is, is one who seeks to cooperate and said this very clearly that he wants to strengthen the multilateralism process in the world. And that multilateralism process was deeply, deeply damaged by the presidency of Donald Trump, who, who treated his, um, his uh, partners with derision and uh, upset the stability in the world. And we've known all this and there's been all kinds of things said and written about Donald Trump. So I decided not to write about Donald Trump but, 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 to, but to write about what the prospects would be for Joe Biden. So I anticipated that he would win the election and I settled down and uh, finished the book in time for uh, his, his actual election. Well, talk about managed expectations. He's, you know, <laughs> I think people are uh, so relieved to get rid of Donald Trump that they haven't really examined the Biden record too closely or what his platform is. Um, but you say that Biden has uh, a triple threat or three emergencies that he's got to contend with. What are those? Well, the world is facing a triple emergency now, Steve. First, in the climate change, and it cannot be emphasized enough how what a dangerous time this is for the world in trying to get control of emissions uh, so that... Uh, uh, to put it bluntly, we don't burn up uh, the world, which is already happening in certain areas, and then there's floods and others. So the, t the conditions of the climate are an absolute emergency for millions upon millions of people. Second is nuclear weapons, the continuation of uh, some now 13,400 nuclear weapons that are still maintained by nine countries, most of them held by the United States and Russia. And then under Trump administration, the breakdown of relations between Russia and uh, the United States and the failure to extend a treaty that would control the number of nuclear weapons, the failure to do that. And uh, Trump pulling out of the Iran agreement to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons. So on the nuclear weapons front, there's been increasing danger and every expert I know says that the nuclear weapon situation is more dangerous now than it has ever been since the start of the nuclear weapons era. On top of that now comes coronavirus, the third emergency. And for, for uh, it, it, we have not seen for a hundred years uh, such a calamity on health conditions and people uh, the suffering and dying, uh, lo losing their jobs and homes, uh, people all around the world, every country has suffered from, uh, from the coronavirus. And so what this has shown us is the vulnerability of people that we're not gonna be saved by weapons of mass destruction. Uh, what we're gonna be, only way we can be saved is through cooperation of all the countries working together on vaccine and uh, on the distribution of the vaccine, countries working together on uh, cutting down emissions uh, so that uh, the global temperature doesn't go up any higher than it is. And also working together to reduce and then eliminate nuclear weapons. Those are the three principal areas that Joe Biden is taking on as president. Um, he, the only way he can make a contribution that he knows this, and that's why I call him a pragmatic idealist, uh, is that he has to cooperate. The United States must cooperate. We all must cooperate. And that seems like a sort of an anodyne thing, Steve, to say, well, of course we must cooperate. But it's because we've lost the ability to cooperate. We've lost the sense of cooperation in international affairs uh, there's been this sense of derision and dominance that has prevailed particularly over the last four years. And so we now have the Alliance for Multilateralism, which was started by France and Germany in 2019. There's 52 countries involved in it, including Canada, I'm glad to say. And so what they need is a spark to uh, enable them to reach out into these areas that I have mentioned of arms control and disarmament, um, uh, environmental protection, the climate, uh, uh, the sustainable development, particularly the sustainable development goals, 17 sustainable development goals that the United Nations has put forward, and then all the advances in human rights. So that's the agenda. And that agenda can only be, can only be handled 
with a cooperation uh, mechanism. And uh, uh, Biden comes into office now with the possibility, and I think the intention, of strengthening the multilateral process so that, that generally we can move forward. He will not be somebody, for example, who will take on the military industrial complex. And I don't think he will do things like that. But by, by opening the door to, first of all, respect, and a, a key for multilateralism is to respect the person that you're dealing with. And that has been certainly absent in the last four years. So respect and reaching out and cooperation in trying to find workable solutions. Uh, it's, it's very difficult because the world is divided. Certainly the United States is seriously divided as we're seeing in the aftermath of the election and the refusal of Trump to concede. And that what that has done is driven deeper into the divisions in the United States. So uh, Joe Biden's first uh, order of business is to, is to just extend a healing hand. Now, whether some of the diehards in the US will accept his hand remains to be seen, but he is going to extend his hand and as he extends his hand out in the United States, that is also a reach, an outward reach into the world. And the world is hungry for this. Um, the, the world is not going to reject Joe Bi President Joe Biden's open hand of conciliation and amelioration and cooperation. They're hungry for it. And that's why I think that the prospects for peace for a saner world, a more stable world, are increasing as uh, Joe Biden becomes closer to the presidency. It's hard for us to see this at this moment because there's still so much fighting going on within the United States. But I believe that that will settle down um, as we get closer to the inauguration of, of Mr. Biden in, in January and that his own agenda will start to come up on top of the news. And thus people will be start to talk about, well, Joe Biden is going to arrive in the, in the presidency uh, finally, what is his agenda? And, and do we have reasons for hope? And that is precisely why I wrote this book in order to capture that sense of forward movement and that people can, can legitimately take some hope for peace in the world through the arrival of Joe Biden in the US presidency. <clears throat> Doug, what about Canada? You know, um, you write in your book that Canada's done a lot over the years. Uh, we've managed to find our role as a middle power. Uh, you point out a number of instances where Canada has taken a dif distinctly different path than the United States, even when there was a lot of pressure to go along, whether it was the invasion of Iraq or missile defense, the, the landmines treaty, uh, even going back to apartheid and, um, and uh, many other instances, the International Criminal Court. Um, we have this great view of ourselves, but as you point out, it's not really shared by everyone in the, in the world in that we've, we've, uh, we've flunked twice to get a seat on the UN Security Council, a, a rotating seat. So, um, you know, it's not as if Canada had a hard time under Trump because we've been in that situation before, I mean, with Bush and Reagan and others, um, and we've managed to carve out a space, but this prime minister, Justin Trudeau, has not really seemed to do that. But let's get to what, looking forward. What, what do you think is going to be the impact of the Biden presidency on Canada? Um, are you hopeful or do you think it's just gonna be more of the same from Justin Trudeau? Well, that of course is a very deep question, Steve, because you're quite right. Um, the Trudeau government preceded the arrival of, uh, of Donald Trump in the US presidency. Um, the, Canada has a mixed record. It has been very strong on, on, in several areas uh, in, in earlier years and uh, uh, have, have done many things that Canadians should be proud of. And I wanna underline that uh, because it, it, it establishes the basis for what I'm gonna say. I mean, Canada has had a strong record of contributing to the development of the world in those areas of economic and social development and arms control um, environment and, uh, and human rights. So we have something to stand on. 
but we stopped standing on it or something happened around the year 2010 and particularly with the arrival of the Harper government which uh, dismissed the importance of the United Nations and lowered Canada's involvement in the UN agenda for peace. And so Canada lost its way uh, for the, about the past 10 years in not uh, remembering and uh, reaffirming our strengths as, a, as, a, as an important middle power country. Middle powers have, have a role to play and uh, Pierre Trudeau, the father of the present prime minister recognized that and that's why he took Canada into the international arena and he, he, he personally went to Washington and Moscow to tell them both in the 1980s to, to, to tell them to cool down on the nuclear arms race and that's but one instance of how Canada as a middle power uh, was able to play a role uh, in influencing the major powers. It's true that as a, as a country of 37 million people, we are small in the sense of, of our population, uh, but we are, you know, in, certainly in the top 10 countries in the world, if you all the factors together, of economy and, and the resources and all the things that measure. And actually we have been rated by the Wharton School of Business that did a, a survey of, uh, of conditions of countries all around the world. Canada was rated as the second best country for the quality of life. So when, when you consider all the advantages and strengths we have in Canada and the, and the, uh, and the need uh, to, to um, reflect and, and, and push those qualities into the international arena for the sake of stability and peace, then you can see that Canada, if you measure it in terms of our international aid, or measured in terms of our peacekeeping, our participation in, in UN peacekeeping, we have declined. We have, we're not on the board. And that's why we were uh, defeated uh, in, it, in, as you mentioned, we've defeated in two successive election, uh, election campaigns for a seat on, this, on the Security Council. We were defeated in 2010 and we defeated again in 2020. Now, that doesn't mean that Canada is worthless or, 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 and it certainly doesn't mean that the other countries of the world do not have any regard for Canada. As a matter of fact, Canada is held in quite high regard, but it's just in this particular election, Norway and Ireland, our two competitors, did, were able to accumulate more votes somewhat. It not, not a, not, was not a, not a blowout, but, but a few more votes to enable them to secure election to the Security Council. But to Canada's credit and to Mr. and to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's credit, he did not then go off and sulk in a corner. Rather, he said, we are going to up our game in uh, the United Nations. And he took on the chairmanship of a special committee uh, that was set up by the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, uh, that, uh, in which Canada co-chaired this committee with, uh, with the uh, Prime Minister of Jamaica uh, to uh, rebuild fiscal systems uh, through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to strengthen developing countries who were hurt adversely by the COVID. And so the people who are most uh, at, at risk in the world, economically and socially, and now through the coronavirus, because they don't have the infrastructure to deal with it, those are the people, and there's millions upon millions of people who need help. And uh, Tr uh, Justin Trudeau did step up uh, for that. And that, that, that committee is continuing. And it is trying, in, in short, it's trying to, to get a more equitable distribution of available international funds through special drawing rights and the, econo and the, and the economic mechanisms that are in play, uh, get, this, to get this to uh, more advantageously for the people of the developing countries. So that's one aspect. And I would say the second is the appointment of Bob Ray to the uh, ambassador of the United Nations. Here is a man who knows his way around the world. Um, he's the son of an ambassador and who, uh, who incidentally was a great influence on me, Bob, Bob Ray's father, uh, Saul Ray. But Bob Ray has, uh, is, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, political appointment of a highly informed and committed person 
is going to lift up, as, as he is already doing, lift up Canada uh, in the international arena. And perhaps there'll be some controversies attached to that. And I, I think, well, that's good. But the important thing is for that Ray and I think uh, Justin Trudeau recognize that time is running out for safe solutions to help stabilize and secure world peace. Doug, thanks a million. Uh, thank you for writing this book. It's going to be uh, a really important handbook, I think, for those of, those of us that are out there campaigning, like you, working for a better world, to help guide us through the next four years of the Biden presidency and where Canada can make a, a great contribution. So thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Doug Roach's new book is called Recovery, Peace Prospects in the Biden Era. It's available through Amazon in printed copy and digital through Kindle.